So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some example, and the example will be based on order processing, which is kind of close to my heart because I spent eight and a half years at Amazon, starting from ordering and then working on different projects there. Uh, and I introduced the notion of a durable execution, which solves problems uh, with current approaches to solve this. And then uh, I explained how it can be implemented using AsyncIO. And then talk about Temporal, which is a specific open source implementation of that idea. And we can talk a little bit more about other possible use cases for this technology. So imagine you are kind of building next Amazon.com, whatever, and you need to do ordering. Obviously, it's much more complicated, but if you look at this code, it's pretty straightforward, right? You just want to run a sequence of steps. So in a very simplified form, it would be check fraud, prepare shipment, charge, like sh ship the order, and then, uh, for example, send confirmation email. So how would you implement that in real production? Like, can you write code like this? Problem is that you cannot, because this process can crash any time. Uh, you can have failures on these uh, uh, other APIs you're calling, or other services you're calling. Also, you can have long-running operations, because, for example, prepare shipment can take a day or two if you're out of stock. So how do we solve that? The standard approach, which probably all of you use or know, and at least learned at school, is that you use some sort of um, event-driven architecture, right? So you will go and ship events, like service will publish event, other services listen to events, reply to them, and it kinda, you kind of stitch these things together. In real life, you usually use queues, because queues kind of nice, because they persist state, and they can help you if your process crashes, so they will redeliver the message. Uh, but problem is that I think this still approach is not good. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to somebody who I, I kind of was tech lead for Amazon Pops Up, for like over, I don't know, almost 10 years. Like not 10, eight and a half in Amazon, so it was five years. And uh, so practically a lot of companies uh, kind of, and uh, groups at Amazon came to our team and to me and say, okay, let's do design review of our backend architecture. And uh, we kind of quickly learned that queues is a very bad way to do uh, this uh, large scale microservice orchestrations, just because um, they don't help with a lot of problems. Like the error handling is bad because uh, practically all you have is deal queues. Uh, then uh, long-running operations are not supported because you cannot have queue like task from the queue take one day to execute. And uh, also your logic is just spread out across multiple services because like uh, imagine you need to do Saga uh, using orchestra uh, choreography. If, if you practically, something fails, then... It, so it's like in this movie, like everything depends on everything, right? Like if you have uh, choreography, like every service depends on any other service because all they do is just listen to messages. The other approach, uh, is, which is kind of uh, pretty well known, is orchestration. So there is a central place which kind of executes this transaction, says, okay, this is, do this first, this second, this is third, and so on, and so on. And orchestration is, uh, has a lot of benefits uh, over choreography, uh, mostly around visibility of the process, define it in one place, and very clear service APIs. Because in this case, if you have fraud, fraud all it needs to do, define is an API for fraud. It doesn't need to do any. Uh, doesn't need to know any about any other service, right? The same thing for fulfillment and payment. Uh, when in choreography, you kind of need to know about other services which run in your ecosystem. So the only uh, service which needs to know about others is service which uses those APIs. For example, in this case, an order. Uh, the problem is like if orchestration is actually gives us so many benefits, why we don't use it? I know some like there are solutions out there, but if you go to average developer and say implement. I don't know, whatever, like deployment or infrastructure automation use case or whatever, they won't even consider orchestration. We'll start building these kind of uh, choreography type solutions. And there are various answers. One is scalability and just developer experience. But in general, I think it's programming model. Because if you, uh, these days you say, oh, I want to use an orchestrator. You're practically immediately forced into this new model of uh, practically drawing diagrams or writing XML or JSON files. Because we cannot write normal code anymore, like, like I had here in my example, right? Process order, like just five lines of code. You practically need to draw a diagram, you need to do, oh, you write a bunch of XML or JSON, because you're practically tr uh, writing, like, I don't know, your normal procedural code in uh, config files, right? JSON, because think about it, it's still procedural, right? But you just write in config files. Or you do DAGs and whatever, but this is uh, very, very limiting, because it's very hard to do complex, complex kind of flow in business logic. So what would be the alternative? Uh, let's look at this original example. Imagine you could just write code uh, like normal, like, like here in this example, 
and it will just uh, deal with all these uh, problems like process crashes, intermittent failures, or long-running operations out of the box. Right, that would be kind of the ideal solution. So that is uh, what I call uh, durable execution. So it's kind of a new concept. I, I'm pretty sure you've never heard about it because it's kind of a new paradigm. The idea is very simple. And again, let's talk about abstract. Like, not, don't think about how we would implement that. Think about an abstract. Imagine I have code which is guaranteed to complete in presence of any failure. So it means that if process crashes after prepare shipment, process will be just migrate, this function will be migrated to another kind of physical process and keep running. Right, and all variables will be preserved, so you don't need to think about crashes. Or if some uh, API fails, it will be retried automatically, and as, as uh, this function is durable, uh, you don't need to think about its crashing, so you can retry forever if necessary, right? And the same thing, if this function is guaranteed to keep running, an operation can take uh, 100 milliseconds, or it can take 10 hours, or it can take five days, API is the same, right? You just call function, like prepare shipment. And prepare shipment can take three days, it's still a block and call. Why can you do it? Because again, this function cannot crash because it's not linked to a specific process. So it's an idea, but how would you wanna, like if I wanna implement it in real life, how would I do it? Obviously you can imagine this magical, I don't know, RAM in the future which will kind of survive process crashes and so on, but it's still not going to help you in the case of distributed system. Imagine this machine completely burns, right? Or like AZ goes down. So how would you do that? So uh, the idea which, uh, we used is uh, actually very simple. Can we just uh, remember what this code did and replay it from the beginning and not re-execute those functions? Let me kind of give you some um, idea how it would work. Imagine we have this function, process order, and we start running that. So we call check fraud, and after check fraud returns, we will have separate kind of persisted history of results uh, in uh, some storage somewhere. And let's say we will go and re record results of that function in that log. So then we will call the next function, and we will recall the result of that function in, a, in that log. We go to the third one, and we record the result of that function in the log again. And then imagine our process crashes. So we will detect that it's crashed, we will go to the different machine, and we just start running that function from the beginning. But in this case, we call check fraud, but we're not going to actually make an API call because we look at the history and say, oh, check fraud is there, it's already executed. So we can go just give this result back to the function directly without practice keeping the actual API call. So we go to the next one, we get the result of the previous one, the same thing, we get it from the log. So we keep going through the log until we kind of hit the end of this, right? And at this point, uh, there is no more log, and what it means that when we call ship, we will actually make a real sh API call to ship, ship service. Very, very simple. Just record results in the log, and when you replay this function from the beginning, use results from the log until you run out of log. And then it practically means your function is recovered, and now you can make real forward progress. Obviously, when you start implementing these things, there are a lot of details you need to take care of. First one is, how do you record the result of the function? Obviously, you can go pretty low level and use some complex, uh, I don't know, web assembly, or like hack, uh, like Python interpreter, or like go pretty deep there. Or practically just because you need to practically intercept all I.O. Uh, but uh, for example, if you wanna be practical, you can do a very simple idea. You can just go and have a function. Let's say every time I invoke this external API, I will have specific function, let's call it execute. And this function will run that API call, maybe retry it as long as necessary. And then it can just capture the result and record it into the log. So this will, uh, it's yes, it's additional uh, kind of overhead of having this function from kind of mental, point of view, but the nice thing is it's very explicit. Because you know, oh, if I call execute, this function is captured. Uh, if I just call some function which is without execute, I mean, I will run this function in line, right? So it will not have this kind of capture capabilities. Uh, the, the other problem which you will run into, if you replaying, this code should be deterministic. What does it mean? So deterministic code is code which uh, produces exactly the same result, takes exactly the same code path, given the same set of external inputs, right? So in this case, if I call some function, it should return always the same result because then I can replay it as many times as you want. If you put random in your code, you know that you will take one branch or another branch like uh, depending on the execution. So what it means is that if you wanna write code which will practically implement durable execution, it cannot have, for example, just use random 
uh, in, in the code. It should practically, it's not allowed, right? Because you, you practically will take different, different code path. You will have the same problem with time. Because if you run this, uh, have some condition based on time now, you run this code now, then you run this code, like try to recover this code like 30 minutes later, time passed, right? You will get different condition, you take different branch. So you need to make sure that if you want to make your code deterministic, besides random, you need to make pro provide deterministic time. What would be the deterministic time? The time which will uh, re return now when you run this code first time, but then it will return the same time every time you replay it. So you, what it means is that you technically need to record in the log the time as well, right? Not just the result of the function, but the moment you, this line of code was executed. The other problem is uh, concurrency, because we know that concurrent code is practically non-deterministic because threads kind of switch, context switches happen any time, and it's not controlled by your process. It's usually controlled by um, environment, like by the operating system. So if you want to make sure that you can have concurrent code, uh, you need to do something about that. You can write some sort of concurrent, uh, uh, like thread thread implementation, which uh, actually in Java we had to do something like that because uh, in Java we actually do in blocking code. But the nice thing about uh, Python that uh, Python has uh, async IO. Uh, so async IO is very nice because it gives you full control over execution of task because Python allows you to implement your own event loop. And when you implement your own event loop, you have full control in the order of how these tasks are executed. And uh, if you want to have deterministic event loop, what would you do? Uh, you would implement practically single queue of tasks, and you run all the tasks in the same thread, right? Like, you just make sure that's single threaded. And if you, oh, like, you do use random in your event loop implementation, or just be very careful about that, that it means that you will be able to run uh, this, uh, pretty complex, like as complex as you want, right? Program uh, with uh, many parallel tasks, like any async IO, async and await, but it will you will be able to guarantee that it runs exactly the same order every task. And then you practically can get full determinism, which means you would be able to recover that using this very simple replay approach. One thing about event loops, they're not only about executing tasks, they're also about IO, right? Because event loop always kind of runs the tasks, then there are no tasks to run, it will block until there is external event coming in, right? If you want this thing uh, kind of, as we capture events uh, for execute, we can kind of convert these uh, execute functions to commands and send them to external service for execution, for example. And then with these commands complete, or there is some additional event, for example, timer firing, you would be able to send these events into the, your implementation of the event loop. And it means that uh, you will, it will practically will apply those events and then run new tasks. Because when you apply events, new tasks will be eligible for execution for async IO. So you kind of have two, loop, two level of loops, right? One loop runs tasks until it runs out of tasks, until all of them are blocked on some external kind of invocation. At this point, you kind of generated a bunch of commands. You send these commands out. And then there are new events. You will apply those events to the uh, kind of um, our blocked program. And then we will run event, uh, event loop again. And so this is kind of double execution can go forever until your program completes. So putting all together. So if you want to recover async Python code, you need to remember function results. You need to separate uh, tasks which execute IO because uh, IO is non-deterministic by definition because it can fail and then not fail. Like, and uh, or, like IO is not deterministic. So you want to move them in separate functions and capture their results. Then you need to make sure that you have deterministic random and you have deterministic time. And uh, then you need a deterministic async IO event loop and you just uh, prohibit run, run, running any code which is uh, uh, just uses threads directly. But is it enough? If you want a practical system, it's not enough. For example, you need to identify that, uh, like if you have multiple of those functions running at the same time, you need IDs, right? For example, if it's order, you need order ID and you have millions of them in parallel. So you need to system which will actually pre uh, provide mapping of those IDs to, to these functions, like order executions. Then you also uh, detect failures, right? Because uh, as I said, if your process crashed, like by itself, nothing will happen. So you need some system which will detect that, find other process to run this and uh, kind of recover that state and continue executing. And then you, as we capture those uh, 
uh, IO tasks as commands, we need to be able to run them somewhere and retry them if necessary, kind of on the system level. And there are a lot of, a lot of other things you need to do. Uh, for example, durable timers. If you want to say, I want to in my code say await sleep for 30 days, you don't want to keep that inside of process, right? You want to be able to move it out, and then uh, there is a durable timer in your system which will fire 30 days later, find appropriate uh, process, recover that, and uh, continue running after 30 days. So how, here we come to Temporal. What is Temporal? Temporal is an open source project. We started at Uber seven years ago. It's been in production. At first, uh, first three years at Uber, we went from zero to 100 use cases. I think right now it's over 1,000, uh, like in, uh, seven years later. And it's used by a lot of companies. So early adopters were HashiCorp, Coinbase, Airbnb, DoorDash, and so on. And, uh, and it's what we call durable execution system because it implements this idea of durable execution, but it takes care of all this other stuff I talked, right? Recovery and so on. And we, besides uh, Py uh, Python, we have uh, SDKs and a bunch of other libraries, so you can mix and match them. Uh, it's, uh, it scales um, uh, linearly to practically any database and any persistent store. We tested up to 300,000 actions per second, but it, we couldn't go higher. We just didn't want to pay this big AWS bill. And, uh, and it's used by a lot of companies. I just uh, was lazy, I didn't put the slide with a bunch of logos here. So how, uh, how does it look from a physical deployment? So Temporal is a service, and it has backend, and uh, this backend uh, runs on top of a database, and it exposes gRPC interface. This service doesn't run your code, it doesn't run the code. Uh, the code is uh, just part of the SDK library which you take your Python, you just include this uh, 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 temporal library and you start writing code like normally. And then uh, when you run this process, this will connect to the backend for gRPC interface, to get tasks and execute them. So from topology point of view, this code runs outside. And they separate activities and workflows. So like this durable execution code is a workflow, an activity is just code which does IO. And uh, they can run in different processes if necessary, or you can collect it in, in one process. Unfortunately, I don't have demo. Come to our booth, I can give you like a real demo of that. Uh, so this is how we would rewrite this order processing workflow uh, if we were kind of using temporal. First, you would just um, uh, do uh, put a decorator on uh, activity. Uh, all you need to do is decorate. It's just normal function, but it can be also a method on instruct. Right, and also uh, you will just uh, write workflow as, as, as a class, and in this case you need to decorate it as well, and then you need to have uh, annotate the main workflow of, uh, function as uh, run. And then uh, for capture we call execute activity, this is kind of like this capture function, and then you also have parameters because you need to specify timeouts, because technically an RPC call, right? You need to make sure that activity is retried after a certain timeout. But otherwise it's just normal code, you can use any constructs of uh, which you use uh, in, t uh, in uh, Python. Uh, so it can be conditions, loops, uh, like uh, everything. And then, as we said, I think IO as well. So I, you don't need, it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's just the whole code I showed you, these five lines, how it will, would look like if you write as, as temporal workflow. Um, so how do we deal with these problems we described before? Determinism. So you have to use practically workflow.random. Uh, you cannot use like random or whatever. So we have actually a special, uh, what we call uh, like a component which will actually detect this, most of those, and f f give you failures if you try to use random directly. Um, uh, but uh, like you have to use uh, what's provided. The same for time. Use workflow.now instead of time, date time now. Or you use async IO now, which also kind of uh, works as well. So the same for concurrency. Nice thing about concurrency is we're using our custom uh, event loop. You don't need to do any changes. You just use normal async IO uh, to do any concurrent thing. So it, there is nothing special, not, not nothing workflow specific there. Uh, you just, if function is annotated, uh, decorated with uh, uh, like workflow, it will be already executed under uh, temporal uh, async IO loop, which means that you just use uh, async IO normal way. Away, you can use await, you can do tasks and so on and so on. So why do you want to use it? Uh, I just gave you ordering example, but think about it. It gives you ability to write code which will survive any failure without additional code, right? So you just, uh, it just keeps running. So some use case, infrastructure provisioning, data doc, all the data of like internal uh, kind of orchestration of their uh, provisioning is done for this. HashiCorp Cloud is built uh, using this approach because uh, they run Terraform as an activity. But you, at the end, you still need to orchestrate a bunch of API calls uh, in the cloud to uh, provision resources and so on. 
Obviously, it replaces business process automation. So if you use BPMN, you can absolutely switch to normal Python code instead of like these diagrams and stuff. And customer lifecycle, because workflows can run forever. So you can technically, because it's a function which keeps state, so you can listen to events and like listen, for example, have a loop which will, uh, I don't know, charge customer once a month, for example. Um, payments, uh, a lot of banks use it for payment processing and so on. Uh, order processing already did, customer support and so on. IoT, you can have digital twin workflow for every device. And uh, other one is low code, no code. Uh, think if you build, uh, because it's code, you can write interpreter for any DSL. So if you have specific DSL, have use case, I say, no, I have customers, I wanna give them special kind of workflow uh, representation, you can create your own DSL and then use this approach to interpret the DSL. So you get scalability and all the benefits of temporal, but you still provide the high level like low code, no code picture to your customers. This is very common. So just to recap, uh, I pre I, I'm saying user orchestration, don't use choreography for the major, if your system is really workflow. Obviously if you just fire or forget, it's fine, right? If fire an event, and listen in some way, if you don't need to reply, it's fine. But every time you have steps, choreography is not the right way. Durable execution is the, the best way to do orchestration. Temporal is the way it's open source project you can use. It's a MIT license to uh, implement, uh, do this. And um, I think our Python SDK is one of the best because of async IO. So you can go to temporal.io for more info, or find to our booth and we will give you demo. We can discuss it more. Uh, that's it, uh, questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, just quickly, the environment management for the workers, uh, is it the same environment as you set up for the, for the main project or can you specify like a Python environment specific to like a workflow or an activity? So uh, it's just normal Python code which you link uh, with the KHS library. So you control the workers. Temporal pro project doesn't care about how workers run, right? So you can use any way to deploy them and obviously, it's because it's Python, there are, I think, limitations on the version of Python, like you, I think I don't think it doesn't work in the very old ones, right? Yeah. But otherwise, you fully control the Python uh, kind of interpreter. Okay, thank you. Hi, thanks, uh, it's a good talk, thanks. Um, I have two questions, if, uh, if I may. Um, first is um, you have like multiple different technologies that you support like Python and Java um, Do they also like work together? Like can I have like different workers in different languages? Yes, and then how do I? Um, uh, uh, define tasks uh, Written in a different language because you use decorators for Python, but for Java, I think um, yeah. Calling a Java task from Python is different. I guess we have actually a sample which has five languages in it uh, activities can be in different language than workflow, and work, we have also child workflows, so child workflows can be, you can do like um, different ones. Basic idea is that on the server doesn't know anything about implementation, uh, at the end when you work activity, mm -hmm. all server sees is a string. And then you take, it can work by string directly, so if you invoke in different language, you can just use string name of the activity or child workflow, or you can actually create an interface which matches. Right, for example, you can have Java interface and Python interface if the names match. You also can specify in the decorator, you can specify the name explicitly, and right. then it just works. Because when you invoke it, all it does, it just takes name out of the function, uh, serializes yep. arguments, okay. and then uh, it sends them out. All right, thanks. Um, then my second question, uh, what happens during, um, uh, uh, during version upgrades or like during deployment of, uh, during uh, deployments um, where a task may or like maybe a workflow now gets um, uh, 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 tasks or activities like inserted or uh, rearranged or something like that. How do you keep track of that? So that is a very good question, how you version long running processes, right? So we have two qu uh, answers. One answer is you version it entirely. For example, when you start it, uh, it will start on the current version and then you will have workers for per version, keep running them, right? Until they drain. So we just released version to make that uh, pretty awesome uh, experience around that. If you need to patch workflow which already running, we also provide that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very actually very silly way you do that. You just say if old version, you keep old code, else like you put new code, and you keep old code until you drain workflows which we is. And when you run it like first time, it will always take new code, but if it's doing, using replay, it remembers that it replayed this uh, past version and will use the last old branch. Right. 
as long as there's some old uh, code still available. Yeah, so you can, uh, because we're running 15 uh, like uh, versions of walkers, right, for workflow which runs for a few months is not very practical. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh yeah, just quickly. Uh, if it's database backed, how do you manage performance? I, I can imagine if you're for every f you know function that you have to run, you have to make multiple calls to a database. How do you stop that becoming slower than just running it synchronously? So uh, think about it this way: uh, if you care about durability, you will have to talk to the database anyway, right? Uh, so uh, if you compare it this like everything in memory, then yes, it will be slower. If you have to implement it yourself, it's comparable performance. And we do a lot of optimizations there. One thing is that server itself scales linearly with database. Uh, we always consider it any database. We consider it 100 node Cassandra clusters. And, uh, and we actually, uh, we, we offer cloud service when we run this backend cluster for you, and we have our custom persistence. As I said, we, we were able to run 300,000 actions per second. And again, we could run higher, just bigger AWS bill. Uh, thank you for your talk. My question is, say we fail in the middle of a workflow, is the whole workflow wrapped in a transaction? Because I can imagine if we add a new customer in one service and it fails in another, that we want to like roll back and not have any customer. Yeah, so again, there are two types of failures. There are inter inter infrastructure failures, or out like process crashes, deployments, all of these. So workflow doesn't even notice that it keeps running, right? But business level failure, for example, I don't know, you do money transfer, withdraw money, deposit money, account doesn't exist for deposit, right? This is business level failure. So in Python case, you probably want to throw an exception, have try catch, and then run compensations. Because obviously, uh, you, people call it saga. And there are better ways to do saga as well, more complex way to do that. But if you need to do sagas, this is a, a lot of people use that just for sagas. Like I know quite a few very big banks for payment system, like this, they just uh, use this system uh, as core system for sagas. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so yours is going to be the last, and it's going to have to be very, very quick. Okay, um, I'll ask a quick question. I'm not sure whether I'll take quick. To it. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, so um, in this talk, you gave an example regarding Python, like async, uh, async IO loop, and so on. Uh, but that's a very Python specific solution. So my question is more general, like how much of the code is kind of um, uh, the same for different, uh, not the same, the logic the same for the different languages? Because obviously Java works differently and Go uh, asynchronous, uh, I, I don't know a lot of Go, but anyway, I imagine it's quite different than Python. So how much um, work was went into actually uh, doing all of those things uh, uh, in different languages to make it basically work yeah, the same. Uh, absolutely correct. Uh, we are trying to be as close to the language as possible. So we want to like language native experience, right? That's why we are, we are trying to do every language differently. In Go, you would actually have blocking call. In Java, also you have a blocking call. Not I think IO, there's no I think. .NET will be I think IO, right? Like I, I, I wait I think. So yes, uh, we, uh, and TypeScript will be I wait I think. Uh, yes, it's a lot of work. We actually have, uh, underneath we have a Rust-based library, which uh, hides 90% of state machine, because there is pretty complex state machine behind the scenes there. And then we have like relatively thin layer, which is language specific, which does this type of integrations. In Java, we practically do for us, but we kind of say, use our API to, we practically do uh, like a sync IO, but on top of threads, it's insane. Talk to me, I can explain that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, please.